Thank you, good evening, and welcome to part two of the complete Prokofiev Sonata series. <clears throat> uh, let me start by again reiterating my thanks to the university for the support of this sabbatical project. Um, at the first program in October, I explained why I had programmed the sonatas as I have, as opposed to simply performing them in numerical order. Let me summarize those remarks for those of you that may not have been here. I have broken them into three programs, programs, splitting up the three war sonatas, one for each program. I've also tried to make each program approximately equal in length. I am calling them short remark lecture recitals as I will make comments about each of the sonatas. Uh, about number two, the first one on the program this evening. The first thing to note about sonata number two is the maturity of the harmonic language. I noted that the most impressive element of the first sonata is the masterful idiomatic nature of the pianism. Uh, Scria, or, excuse me, Prokofiev was uh, all of about 14 or 15 when the first sonata was completed. But nevertheless, it's a, it, he handles the piano in a magnificent way. Nevertheless, one might guess that sonata number one might be by Scriabin or any of a number of late romantic composers. But by opus 14, Prokofiev has found his own unique harmonic style. This sonata was completed in 1912 when Prokofiev would have attained the ripe age of 21. He premiered this sonata himself the following spring. The second sonata sounds pretty tame to us but apparently not his conservatory colleagues. One, a student by the name of Mr. Sabanyayev, declared it to be, quote, a true offspring of the modern football generation, stupid, inane, and blockheaded. All four movements are in classic or neoclassic structures with a few divergences. The first movement features a second theme in a different meter. It is in three as opposed to the duple meter of the rest of the movement. That becomes interesting in the development section as the second theme is superimposed over first subject material as, Pro as Prokofiev so frequently does. The meter change is handled by presenting the second, second theme in augmentation. The second movement is a scherzo but in a duple meter. Normally scherzos are in a meter of three. But precedent for that goes back as far as Beethoven opus 31. I am somewhat surprised that the third movement was not titled Funeral March. It is certainly funereal, even in a programmatic manner. The opening pre presents a wailful melody above a walking figure and thick bass chords every measure or so reminiscent of bells. I think it is not too subjective to suggest. This is answered by a surreal melodic figure seven beats in length repeated several times. This is followed by a new melody as active as the most solemn Gregorian chant. It is only four tones in length, and the words dies irae would fit. The main melody and seven beat figure return again to finish the movement. The last movement is a sonata form again. Two features should be noticed. The midsection or development begins with a return to the second theme of the first movement exactly as it was stated at, the, at that same spot in the form in that movement. Also, Prokofiev's penchant for compiling theme is done here as well as anywhere. In the recapitulation, a spot occurs where the first theme, second theme, and two accompanying motives all take place at the same time. Prokofiev included the second sonata on his first New York recital, November 28, 1918. I was amused by his comments in his autobiography about the reviews. I quote, the New York press, whose opinion was decisive in procuring provincial engagements, was on the whole satisfactory. Even its unfavorable comment was served up in a somewhat sensational manner. Uh, in appraising my music, the critics wrote a good deal of nonsense. For example, the best of them maintained that the finale of the second sonata made him think of a herd of mammoths charging across the Asiatic plateau. 
of my playing, they said it had too little gradation, but that I had steel fingers, steel wrists, steel biceps, and triceps. No wonder the black lift attendant in the hotel touched my sleeve and remarked with some awe, steel muscles. He evidently thought I was a boxer. I will now wrestle with sonata number two.
Thank you very much. Uh, how about sonata number three? This is certainly the most popular of the nine sonatas. The reasons why are ample. In a single movement, it is elegantly compact, rather reminiscent of Haydn in that all of the themes are motivically related. The change of tempo for the second subject imparts the sense of contrast, usually provided by contrasting movements but it also contains, in my opinion, some of the trickiest pianism in any of the sonatas. Both this and number four, sonata number four, are subtitled from old notebooks. Although they are opus 28 and 29, the main ideas of both were originally conceived during his conservatory years. But I have found nothing about what the changes were from his early conception uh, and opus 28 or 29. <clears throat> One thought expressed in his bi autobiography I find interesting. He makes the remark that a friend of his, Asafiev, had lost a bet because his performance of Sonata III was completely different than before he, Prokofiev, left for America, essentially because he played it at a different tempo. Tempo is such a critical element in the performance of music. It is intriguing to hear a composer of Prokofiev's stature state that he himself has changed his mind about the tempo of his own composition. Here is sonata number three. There'll be about a five minute interval between that and uh, the continuation of number four.
Uh, about Sonata number four, I guess the microphone is off. Along with Sonata five, the reception for Sonata number four was not very enthusiastic. Prokofiev remarks that the fourth Sonata is too slow to generate much enthusiasm. In this, I think he refers to the first two movements. The first movement is an uncharacteristic uh, piece. It's rather slow and heavy, and with the second theme that some writers describe as neo-baroque. I am confused by this description, unless they refer to the odd ornamentations that accompany the second theme, which sound more like hiccups than any Baroque any ornamentation that I'm familiar with. The opening of the first movement has been described as a skazka, or a fair, like a fairy tale. If we are comfortable with the idea that many fairy, fairy tales contain dark moods, then the appellation is apt. In this movement, oh, excuse me, the second movement was originally uh, conceived as an orchestral work and involves a, a theme that is in canon that is then set later in inversion with itself. So it's both going both one direction and ups, it's upside down at the same time. In this movement, we have to wait for the coda for the compilation of the two themes in, intermingled between the inversion and the canon of the theme is another one of Prokofiev's very lyrical white note melodies. And finally, in the coda of this movement, he combines the two of them at the same time. The last movement is a wild contrast and features some decorative scales split between the right and left hands at the opening and coda of the movement. One wonders if these scales were a problem for Prokofiev under normal conditions. conditions. They were under some. Again, I quote his biography. This is while he was making a film or somebody was filming him. I quote, they surrounded me on every side with dazzlingly bright lamps which not only blinded me but also made me also hot. Then they asked me to play something featuring the hands jumping about all over the place. For that, I chose the finale of the fourth sonata where scales are taken in turns by both hands. And of course, being distracted by hissing lamps and the cameraman cranking his handle around like mad, I made a frightful hash of it. Then I thought, supposing this film is kept for posterity, and in order to find out how the composer plays his works, it gets projected in slow motion. <laughs> then the full extent of my infamy will be revealed. I now follow in his footsteps.
Thank you so much. Just a lot of infamy. <laughs> About Sonata number seven. Prokofiev's, <laughs> this is kind of funny, I think. Prokofiev was once asked to define a classical composer. He replied, a classical composer is a madman who writes music that his own generation dismisses as incomprehensible. <laughs> this is because he has discovered a certain logic that is incomprehensible to them. Only in time does this logic become clear to all, usually after his death. If he had largely kept to rules laid down by past masters, he would have written music that all his contemporaries would have, been, would have understood, but it would have died with him. So he prefers to be thought mad and to have his work live after him. If the seventh had been the first or the only piece of Prokofiev I heard as a youngster, I may have thought, he's mad, I'll pay no attention to him. Fortunately, it was not, but I remember being pretty bewildered by the seventh the first time I heard it. Of course, now the logic of, uh, the logic of it is clear to me and most everyone. Indeed, of the war sonatas, it is the most frequently played. It was premiered by Sviatoslav Richter in 1943 and its bellicose nature make it easy to place at the height of World War II. The first movement is a sonata form made neoclassically clear by the use of different tempi for first and second theme material. The second movement begins with a theme that sounds something like something from a popular tune. That pleasant mood does not last very long, however. The seventh is probably the, excuse me, uh, uh, the seventh is probably the most popular of the war sonatas because of its last movement, which is all in a meter of seven, an irregular meter. It is difficult to write sensible music in irregular meters. Usually the irregular measures have internal metric units. To, make, uh, to name a couple well-known examples of irregular meters, Dave Brubeck's Take Five, where the meter is in five, is actually written inside each of those measures as a group of three followed by a group of two. Or the tune Money from Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, well, uh, is in seven, but it falls internally in groups of three followed by four. Prokofiev designates on the top of the score in the, in the last movement that the breakdown of this meter of seven throughout the movement is two plus three plus two. So the, there are internal divisions within the bar. The last movement is most like a rondo in structure. Um, its final version the, of the main theme, and it's stretching this to call this opening material a theme. Its final version is expanded through doublings and octave transpositions until it's kind of an organized chaos that makes use of every, every part of the keyboard. This is keyboard writing that only a few composers have been capable of writing. Here's number, sonata number seven.